Woo-hoo. What's up, everybody? Um, <clears throat> nice to meet you all in this weird virtual fashion. Um, <clears throat> I'm so much more interactive than Zoom usually allows for. Um, so I've got like a bunch of notes. I'm going to do, I don't know, maybe like 15, 20 minutes of them. Um, and then I'll like pause for like questions. And then if after that folks have questions, you can just start interrupting. Does that, that work for folks? I hope that works for folks. Yes. Awesome. Cool. Um, okay. So um, I guess the big question that I have around this whole psychedelic renaissance or whatever is um, it's kind of like psychedelic so white, you know, like why is this such a white middle class, upper middle class educated sort of movement or renaissance? Like, what is that about? Um, and when I think about it, because it's not like, I mean, they, there's a long history tradition of people, everyone um, altering their, their consciousness. So what is it about this Renaissance? So what is it about this time that lends itself particularly to a form of alteredness um, that usually favors whiteness? Um, and I think in order to understand that, we sort of have to interrogate what we mean by getting high um, and what we mean by ethnic, eth I always say it wrong, um, entheogens and psychedelics. Um, I would say that tripping, however you define that, is part of an African tradition, but it's a tradition of healing. Um, and that the framing of partying um, or getting high or getting wasted or getting fucked up and as a result, I think the other side of that is, you know, like tuning out or like tuning in and all that. That diet comes from a framing of um, college age students in the 50s abusing pharma, sorry, college age students in the 60s abusing pharmaceuticals that came out of the 50s. And so once they started making their own um, chemical um, substances, then that became the culture of tripping and that became the culture of hallucinogens. But um, in the U.S., but there are other there are other traditions of altered states of consciousness in the U.S. Um, that I think are important to look at. And I mean, none of this is controversial because you know there's Native American traditions that have gone on for years using um, psychedelics, and but we don't talk about those in the same way that we talk about um, sort of the psychedelic renaissances that are happening now. But even as we talk about um, psychedelics and entheogens. Even the, the, the definitions have sort of a colonial, a colonial bias in their interpretations. So like if you look at a definition of psychedelics, they say it's a, psychedelics are a hallucinogenic class of psychoactive drugs whose primary effect is to trigger not an ordinary states of consciousness. Well, what is an ordinary state of consciousness, right? If we have a shared biased understanding, then what seems ordinary may be actually unordinary, for instance, living in a capitalist society or being uh, part of chattel slavery. See where I'm going with this? Um, if we use entheogen as, as a term, like that's like a chemical substance, typically a plant origin that is ingested to produce a non-ordinary state of consciousness for religious or spiritual purposes. So now we have a double bind, right? We've already talked about the, um, you know, the bind of what, a, what an ordinary state is. But if you say it's for religious or spiritual purposes, well, one of the carryovers of black religious life from Africa is to not separate the sacred from the divine. I mean, the sacred from the profane. So a prayer to get into a good school, a charm to keep bad lovers away, a potion to protect a child, a bath to heal a wound, a smoke to bind brothers. Are these religious ceremonies or are they just day-to-day -day life, right? We, f we find like the, the term psychedelic and entheogen are ill-fitting uh, for the main reason that this new psychedelic renaissance is crafted by white language, right? Sure, you're going to have a Jimi Hendrix or even a me, a learned scholar, a uh, black scholar somehow involved. And, you know, you'll even find some traditional maestros from Brazil and Colombia that may be black. But the movement in the U.S. will still be white so long as substance use is not married to the survival needs of people of color. So for today, I'll be talking about survival needs of Black people. In particular, I'll be talking about how Black people in the U.S. have used substances in the past, how we may use them in the future, and how we might be able to reimagine the role of psychedelics for everyone. Okay. 
black use of substances in general has to lend itself to survival, just like everything black in the US. It has to in some way inform our survival. Psychoactives that are for recreation only, well, they have to be short acting, which is why they're generally inhaled um, or snuffed like through the nose or um, lungs or the nose, right? As a black person in America, you have to keep your eyes open. You have to be able to protect yourself at all times. This lack of fully letting go plays into, I'm sure you've heard about like set substance and setting, like in terms of in terms of the effect of a substance that those three things are sort of important. Well, when your set is against you and your setting is always trained to be on the alert, sometimes it takes a lot more substance or a different sort of substance in order to have that let go that sort of psychedelics allow people to have. Um, that's why when I talk about substances, and that's why I'm saying substances, I'm not saying drugs, I'm not saying medicines, I'm not saying um, even foods necessarily, right? It's a substance, but it's always about the relationship between the person and the substance. So we currently classify drugs in a bit of a backwards way, right? Supposedly, if a substance stimulates your central nervous system, it's a stimulant. And if it depresses it, it's a depressant. And if it makes you hallucinate, then it's a hallucinogen, right? Well, what about if you're starving? right? Starvation is, produces hallucin um, hallucinations. So is starvation a hallucinogen? Would you count ginger as a stimulant if you ate it for a while, right? Or spicy peppers, like, like uh, yeah, like spicy peppers. If you eat them and they make you sweat, and if you eat enough, you can make, they can make you hallucinate. Well, are they hallucinogens? And what about poppy seeds, right? Do they count as depressants? What we're talking about is if you look at the history of African-Americans and substance use, it's not a history of intoxication. Substance is used for the sole purpose of altering the normal state. But instead, it looks at what we've had to eat, what we've had to utilize to survive, to stay healthy, to endure the suffering of slavery, the prison industrial complex, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. I'm assuming you all know this. I don't want to belabor the point. It's not to say we don't have a history of um, intoxication use, but our history is a bit more complex when it comes to the relationship with plants and their effects. Am I, am I following? Is everybody following me so far? I'm like looking at my notes. I'm not really looking at, but okay, awesome. Um, I'm putting in the, uh, the chat again, um, that, fo that file that I had before. That's just a bunch of images that I'll pull from every now and then. So I'm going to pull from the first one now. Actually, no, well, you can look at it anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, I wanna start, when I talk about African-Americans and plant use, um, I wanna talk about this guy named Papin. And in 1729, Papin was freed from slavery in return for a venereal disease cure that he kept secret. This was not uncommon, okay? In 1749, a slave named Caesar was freed in exchange for his snake bite and poison cures. And later they became like the, the source of this antebellum red, um, remedy book. So these men and these women that I'll talk about in a second were known as root doctors. The adoption of their skill into the works of white dominant medical text let us know that their expertise outstripped the medicine of the time. So, we shouldn't be surprised by this. We know that black people were brought um, to this country to work with plants, right? And they were brought here to work tobacco, cotton, sugar plantations, and hemp fields, right? And they were not paid nearly enough and they weren't fed well. So to survive, slaves needed supplements to their meager meals with plant-based diets that not only fortified them, but gave them the life to strengthen and, and to dream of a better day. And there were no pharmacies, and so they had plants. We know, for instance, that black women used cotton root for abortions. Another recipe was tansy, rue, pennyroyal, and cedar berries. I'm saying all this to say that the relationship, the black relationship with plant knowledge was extensive. And if we can extend our imaginations a bit, we may be able to see that that, that relationship with plants was a key to our survival and striving for liberation. Okay, now, if you want to go to that file that I uh, put in there, which now I have to find. Wait, would it, would it be possible to screen share? Yeah, but then I can't see my notes is the only thing. Oh, okay. All right, no worries. 
but if you go on that, if you just like scroll past the lyrics, um, you'll see that first image. Um, and this was painted by a white woman, uh, Mary Liddy Hicks. Um, but the, the picture on the top is a woman with a collared leaf on her head to cure headaches. Now, listen, I've never done this, but um, it was a remedy that was well known throughout North Carolina and my people are from North Carolina and um, some people still do that. I've never done it, I don't know if it works. But I'm using it just to show that there is this intimate relationship with all parts of plants in ways that we don't talk about anymore, right? If you scroll right below that, you'll see another woman. This woman was actually born into slavery, Sarah Gredger. She spent the first 50 years of her life in slavery and she was known as a root woman on her plantation. She was so well known that other white plantation owners would come to her to ask for her knowledge about plants, okay? So if somebody has, if a people have this much knowledge on plants, I hope, like, I'm just using to say, like, I hope we, we can imagine that, you know, having an altered state of consciousness is not new for these people, right? That, like, they're using plants for damn near everything. So why aren't they using them to, to alter their states of consciousness? And I gave you the article on the Great Dismal Swamp. I'm not sure if you all read that. And if you haven't, that's fine. Um, but it's a really cool article. Um, and if, if I could add real quick, if you guys haven't read it, I highly, highly recommend it. It's very, like both the articles were very refreshing in the context of all of the academic publications, like the scientific journal articles we've been reading so far. It can be fun, I guess, if you like that stuff, which I do sometimes, but you know, I'm a more culture person. Um, but yeah, so the dismal I gave to you because my, my, grand, my grandfather's people are from there. Um, sorry, my grandmother's people, I screwed that up. My grandmother's people are from the Dismal. My grandfather's people are, are Gullah people, which have their own history. But the Dismal Swamp has fascinated, fascinated me for years because in many ways it represents this black hole in the history of black America. It's a place where black, white, and native American people ran for isolation. At one point it was over 20 miles wide and spanned between Virginia and North Carolina. And the biological diversity was imposing and intense. And even though George Washington was the first person, to, first person to try and drain it, it wasn't until well after reconstruction that all the former runaway slaves finally emptied from it. So uh, what did those plant wielding African Americans who intermingled with native communities know about plants in the swamp? You, you could literally write a dissertation and go into all the different plant uses, uh, plants and the uses that, that there were in the dismal, but I wanna focus on two that we knew grew in abundance there, okay? Um, the first was, you know, and these are pretty basic, um, tulip trees. And the second one was uh, Magnolia Virginia, AKA swamp sassafras, okay? It's known um, that both are hallucinogens and stimulants and both were used by the people in those swamps, okay? Um, the tulip ones, uh, the green bark was chewed to get that stimulant effect. The second one, um, the sassafras, they like breathe the incense of it and they used it to flavor the water. Um, the thing with uh, the dismal is that all the, the water stayed fresh longer, but it had tannins in it that made it taste really weird. So they would flavor their waters on a regular basis. But here's the thing. In Tasmania, they make a beer using sassafras and beer yeast that has psychoactive properties. So this isn't fact, but I'm just asking you to imagine. You can imagine it would be impossible. It would be possible. Well, one, it's impossible to not get yeast into anything grown in a swamp, okay? And since it was clear that they flavored their waters, can we imagine a group of runaway slaves in the dismal drinking psychoactive brews? But whatever they were doing, I can tell you this, they weren't getting high. Because getting high as a concept is a postmodern a religious activity based on leisure, right? Whatever two hones or whatever was found in the, the cedar of the dismal, whatever known psychedelics they were consuming or whatever sassafras or tulip root tinctures they were consuming, it wasn't for the sole purpose of getting altered. What I put forward is that the use of substances in this context was either about survival or pain relief. And pain relief, when your pain is your norm, right? 
can be seen as a hallucinatory if your entire life is designed around that pain. The Dismal was a rough place to live. It was the northernmost swamp that slavers were afraid to enter. It was dangerous. Um, to live there, one had to be not only alert and crafty, so you can't really just get fucked up, but you also had to value your own life beyond what it could, pro could produce. One had to imagine themselves worthy of freedom, and they had to imagine their lives as more than the sum of their la labor. So is it too hard to believe that the altered mindsets of those runaway slaves in the dismal swamp was kind of what helped keep them free, right? That perhaps what they were connecting to was something greater than the life of labor that they were thinking about that, that would exist outside of the swamp. I don't think it's that far of a stretch to connect plants with some form of divinity for these people. If you go back to that file, um, that image, and you scroll down one more past Messera Gwedger, you're gonna see Osein. And Osein is the god of forest, herbs, medicines, magic, power, and healing. It's a Yoruba, uh, Yoruba god, right? Um, the Yoruba, in the Yoruba context, he's the protector of all plant medicines and wisdoms. If you ever heard the term ashe, that's, the, um, that's a Yoruba term. And it means the elixir from which all life flows and that is living in all things. Osein collects the ashe from all liquid bearing plants for humans to use. I'm not saying there's a direct connection between this um, Yoruba God and African-Americans. Well, kind of, a little bit, kind of. Because what we found is in South Carolina and in Georgia low country, they have a feature in their crops and their crop growing where they plant sesame at the end of each row. And the same planting tradition is found in the West Indies um, as a way to repel thieves and intruders. And it's also found in West Africa as a tribute to Osein. Right? So we do have this long history of connecting plants with the divine, having it be an ex experiential thing, and having it not be just about um, getting high or getting fucked up. So what happened? How do we get from that to today? Um, if you look at the final image of um, that file, you'll see a picture of Linda Taylor, supposedly the, the welfare queen. One of the things that happens in the 80s is, um, sorry, late 70s, early 80s, is that the substance use of African Americans is re-invitalized as a way of oppressing black, as oppressing black people. So we already know, I hope we already know, we use the term marijuana, not because all of a sudden America wants to speak Spanish when talking about substances, but as a way of excluding Mexican labor in the US um, when we've invited Mexican labor in the US from 1890s to 1920s, you want them out. They say, oh, Mexicans are smoking marijuana. It's that, de that demon devil lettuce that'll kill us all. We need to get them out. Um, there's a similar tradition in the 1930s and 40s in New Orleans. They're saying that black men who, uh, black men are doing a bunch of cocaine, not like everybody's doing cocaine down there, um, but black men are doing a bunch of cocaine and as a result, they're gonna rape white women. And so it's very important that we make sure that black men don't do cocaine anymore. Right, so we've we've got this hist like the history of drug prohibition in the U.S. is intimately connected with um, racist policies. Right, we're all aware of that. Right, there's no I'm not surprising anyone with this one. Right, just yay, nay, something. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, what happens in the '70s is that African Americans start internalizing that. Right. And we start referring to people like Linda T Taylor, the welfare queen, as people who um, are bringing the culture down. And we start equating substance use, right, intoxication with um, the denigration of the race. Um, when we look at uh, the history of heroin use in the US, right, uh, GIs coming back from Korea and Vietnam. Um, high on heroin, what we find is that African Americans are actually coming back with less heroin dependency than um, white Americans, but the stigma around heroin use for African Americans is 10 times higher. Similarly with the notion of crack babies or crack mamas, if you've heard of that. Um, originally the image of the crack, the crack mother was a woman who, um, who was very sad that she was addicted to crack 
and that she was pregnant, well, she was addicted to crack, and so her baby was addicted to crack, and she needed a bunch of services. And that woman tended to be white. As soon as that woman was seen as a black woman, then she was a drain on public systems and a, and a drain on, on public services, right? So when you've got that imagery coming in through the 60s, um, through the 70s and 80s, it's pretty easy to see that altered states of consciousness are seen as ways in which you are going to um, not be able to have upward mobility as an African American. No longer are we connected to our root medicine knowledge, no longer are we connected to like ancient African systems. It's all about you have to be sober in order to have to um, advance socially um, and economically. That is not a bias that is necessarily upon privileged white people. And so that's why um, the psychedelic renaissance doesn't speak often to uh, black people or to people of color or to people um, or to poor people because to alter your consciousness means you're not gonna then be able to improve your state of being. Does that make sense? All right, big blah, blah, blah there. Thoughts, questions, please. Victor Mercado says 100%. Thank you, Victor. Do you want to say more? Yeah, Annabelle, what's up? Okay. So um, I just had a question about like what your opinion would be on like, I've seen a lot of things where people like they'll just go and they'll go to like, especially like my, my instinct is like the Kardashians, how when they went to Thailand, they went and they did like all of these rituals, some of which included psychedelics. What's your opinion on that? And do you think that it's borderlines on cultural appreciation or cultural appropriation? I mean, my opinion is um, if you are not going into a culture with a sense of reverence and respect, then it's appropriation. Um, I like to, the question that I tend to ask myself, having done fairly similar things, is not necessarily what I'm taking out, but what am I bringing in? Right. So if I'm coming, if I'm coming and I'm like, oh, you know, like I want to do what you people do and I want to, I want to see how you see and have a good time and then sleep in my, you know, eco village friendly, you know, lodge and then dip out. Well, cool. Money's great. But like, how am I, how, what am I bringing in? How am I being a, a useful member of that community? Um, so when people don't do that, yeah, I, I, I do have serious questions. But I also have questions about, especially Americans feeling like we need to go to other cultures in order to experience psychedelic, exp have a psychedelic experiences. You know what I mean? Like, what is it about that that makes sense? Like, why are people, like knowing that everything in ayahuasca grows in the US, why are people going down to Peru? Why, like, why are people going to the Amazon? What is, what is that about? Yeah, I definitely think, I like, I see all these things, especially with um, marijuana use becoming a lot more popular, especially in California. Like I see people growing it or I see like my white mother going to the dispensary. And I think that it's just like, these are the same people who were criticizing this kind of thing 10 years ago. And now it's cool. It's like mainstream kind of. Right. And so what we know is that it's not the substance, right? It's not, it's not the thing itself, right? It's our view of who does the substance. So I used to, you know, a little while back when I was teaching another substance class, I was like, you know, what does a drug-filled neighborhood look like, right? And people were like, oh, you know, trash on the street, you know, you know, people running around. I'm like, well, what about the suburbs? Like, you go to any suburb, I promise you, you go in the medicine cabinet, there's enough to get you, your entire family, and the dog messed up, right? But we don't think about that as a drug-laden community, right? In fact, those drug-laden communities that, we, that we're talking about, they generally tend to be under-resourced communities. They tend to be heavily policed communities. And substance use is an easy way to over-police a population, right? They're doing drugs there. So as a result, we get to kick down their door. We think that person might be a drug dealer. That's why we shot him, right? That's why for me, when talking about psychedelics, to talk about psychedelics in a pocket and to not talk about how they relate to broader substance use, that's a problem. That's like, I think that's some like, we call it psychedelic exceptionalism, 
right? That like, oh, well, no, no, don't get me wrong. Me smoking DMT for five hours a day, that's different than you doing heroin three times a day. It's like, well, why? Actually, if you get, I mean, both, if you get clean heroin, I'm not advocating the use of heroin. Actually, I don't care if you do heroin, um, but like, I'm not advocating use of heroin, but like if you get clean heroin and you can hold down your job or do what you need to do, how is that any different than smoking a bunch of DMT or LSD or, you know what I mean? But we have different biases about who, who does what drugs. Thank you, that was really, insightful it gave, it gave me a lot that little hamster wheels turning <laughs> um, um yeah. wait, re re real quick and i think this might kind of tie into what you said at the end um sheer put in chemical dependence um is there more sheer is there more of a more of a question behind that or is that a rough draft of a of a question no i get uh, it I, that's like a question like in the sense of like how do you classify the use of certain drugs what like from what I understand, most psychedelics don't necessarily have a like a chemical dependence associated with it, whereas so, something like heroin uh, does. Right. So let's talk about dependence, okay? And I'm glad you said dependence as opposed to abuse, um, addiction, right? Because once you start talking about addiction, I and I worked in chemical dependency for six years, I still can't call somebody else an addict. Right, I don't, I don't know what that, I don't know what that means. Dependency we can define. Dependency is basically if you have, um, if you have withdrawals from not having the substance, you're chemically dependent upon it. Right. Well, sorry, you're dependent on it. If your withdrawals, which is pretty much like highly, like like being very uncomfortable, right? If your withdrawals are psychological and that you can't name the the physiological impact on it, then they say you have a psychological dependence on it. And for some reason, people treat psychological dependence as different than physical dependence. Regardless, you go cold turkey the most about 10 days on all of it, you're actually gonna be okay. And that includes DMT. The worst thing, the absolute worst thing to deal with in terms of um, dependence like the thing that, like the one where like the withdrawals might kill you. Anyone? 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 Benzodiazepines. Alcohol. Alcohol. Alcohol is the withdrawal that'll fuck you up. Sorry. Can I swear? I hope so. Um, yeah. Yeah. Alcohol is the is, are the withdrawals that that'll mess you up. Heroin withdrawals suck, but you'll be okay. I will say that I have heard of a. Um, psychological dependence on DMT, right? That like people get really into DMT and it's really hard for them to not do it. I have definitely seen people, um, I, would, I would say psychologically dependent on LSD. That like that altered state is what they need in order to navigate through the world. So, and, and I totally hear your question here because I think 10 times more than you. I'm old as, I'm old as fuck. I'm like 46. I grew up with a just say no freaking group, right? Like they were like, if you, if you smoke a joint one time, you're going to be in a trailer down by the river for the rest of your life. And this, right. And so we just had it in our heads, which I think fucked up our highs. Um, we had it in our heads that like our, that dependency was something that was going to happen if you did something more than like once or twice. Right. And like, I remember, growing up joking around being like, I guess I'm dependent now, you know, cause I'm like after 45 times, like, right. But um, I think in actuality use, substance use is a lot more subtle. I think there's a lot more variables. Um, I think there's a lot more um, give and take. I think a lot of it has to do with culture. You know, one of the things I'm really looking at right now as I focus on, you know, a lot of African-American stuff African-Americans have higher instances of um, high blood pressure, diabetes, all that stuff. Well, how does that impact um, oxytocin? How does that impact serotonin? How does that impact all of these other neurotransmitters that these substances are supposedly triggering? The research isn't even there. 
right? Like nobody's even looking at that, right? So that's where I feel like there's all these gaps that I hope, especially to, talking to an undergrad class looking at um, psychedelics, that over the next five, 10 years, folks will start paying a little more attention instead of just being like, oh, it's just, you know, we're all touching the galactic mother and, you know, as soon as we take five tabs of LSD or something, you know what I mean? Um, it's, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's it's really interesting to think about that, especially in the context of all of the research being done about like, you know, psychedelic assisted therapy for, for addiction, you know? Even looking at some of that therapy, there's a woman who's written, um, she was in the MAPS. Are you all familiar with MAPS? Um, I think a lot of us are, but maybe maybe just a quick primer. We did talk about MAPS last class because we had someone from there. Yeah. Oh, so basically like the, the only leg the, uh, legit above ground studies of um, MDMA and ketamine, and I think they're doing LSD too, I'm not sure. Um, but there's a black woman who is in the, uh, the MAP study for MDMA. And she was saying that she was getting microaggressions before she started taking the substance from her two um, people that were supporting her. And that MAPS as a whole was not supportive of her as an African-American woman going through, the, um, going through the experience. Not through like hostility, not like, you know, boo, bad black lady, but basically not being culturally, um, culturally sensitive and appropriate. Um, and I've heard this from other African-American women, specifically other African-American women as well. So as we start looking at the research, I really hope, again, you really smart and amazing people are going, well, who's, who are in these clinical trials, right? What are they experiencing, right? Who bailed out of the clinical trials, right? Who don't you have enough research on to make an educated guess about how this stuff is going? Because I think right now there's a lot of like, yay, everything's great, everything's awesome, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like in actuality, there's still some of the old biases um, are still there and still like messing with folks. Question. Cool. Um, I, I know that Landon and um, Harley prepared some questions in advance. If either of you two want to um, share those questions, go ahead. Yeah, hi, I'm Harley. Um, thanks for uh, coming. This has been really awesome and super refreshing to get like a different outlook on um, uh, substances. Um, one of the things we were thinking about based on the readings that uh, we were given was um, how we were curious on how um, herbalism and the maroons, I think that's what they were called, um, were uh, how they're, if they are connected to voodoo. Yes. So voodoo um, is the <clears throat> Haitian influence practice of, um, again, connecting the, the spiritual with the material world, right? Um, I think one of the interesting, for this, one of the interesting um, aspects of voodoo when I say Vodun, I can also say Condomble, I can say Santeria. Um, these are all uh, syncretic religions that basically started, sorry, a form of them came from the Yoruba people of Africa. When they came to the US, they were merged with different Catholic saints, um, other things from the US, and so they became their own thing, right? So in Haiti, it became uh, Vodun. Um, in Colombia became Santeria, I'm sorry, in Cuba it became Santeria and so on and so forth. But one of the things that's uh, a through line in all of them is that they are, they are uh, trance-based religions. Does that make sense? Um, the idea is that the gods come into the body, right? So if I am a practice, Let's say I'm a practitioner and I am, um, Ogun is my God, right? Ogun is the God, he's a blacksmith. He's a God of fire, right? And so there's a whole tradition and there's a whole culture and there's a whole ritual. And the goal is for Ogun to come into my body. Well, how do you know Ogun is in your body? Well, he is a blacksmith and so fire can't hurt him. And so when people have Ogun in their body, they will be able to pick up 
a piece of fire. I've seen people pick it up and I've seen people take a bite out of it and they were not burned, right? Um, Ogun can't be hurt by a weapon. So they'll take a sharp machete and they'll like smash it on their arms and it won't hurt them, okay? Um, why does this matter in this context? Every god has their own plants that are attracted to them or they, they are attracted to, right? So, so this is what I was talking about before, this notion of getting high doesn't really exist in the African context, but possession through the use of plants and sacred medicine does happen. Does that make sense? I still see questioning faces. Okay, think about it this way. You go to a rave, you guys don't even do raves anymore. What do you do? Um, we did at one point. I know, back in the day. Um, you go to a huge party, right? And like, and you're on something and you're feeling it, right? Only instead of it, it now has a name and it now has a personality and it now has a certain song that it likes and it has foods that it likes and it has colors that it likes. And when you're in it and you're fully in it and everybody knows that you're in it, you are in a different psychological, some would say spiritual state, right? So that is a tradition that has been brought over from Africa in these different Vodun, Santeria, Condomble, da 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 Yes, exactly. It is like a map of altered states. Only those altered states are called gods. So one interesting thing with that is that those um, African traditional religions, they don't have statues of their gods, right? So even the one that I showed you, that's a, that's a bowl to pick berries and stuff in, right? It's not a statue because the representation is the spirit goes in the person. It doesn't go externally. So yeah, Hope, does, did that answer your question, Harley? More questions, comments, concerns, any? Um, I have a question. Oh, sorry. You can go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> cool. Um, I I was wondering if there uh, we've talked about we've talked about a, a few plants um, and sacred plants like you know psilocybin we've or yeah right and in mushrooms we've talked about you know San Pedro I think for a second and all these different things I was wondering if there are other like sacred plants that uh, you mentioned like sassafras and the wheat but if there are other sacred plants that maybe are less known um that's you know important to you or that is yeah that you'd like to share i mean I, so there's sacred plants and i feel like your relation to any plant can be sacred and then there's um plants that we know have um psychoactive properties right um sassafras um so basically you can synthesize sassafras to get mda which is sort of a precursor to MDMA. Um, I, and this is kind of what I was trying to argue before. I think any plant that can reduce pain for people that are living in pain on a regular basis could be seen as oh, like altering. Do you know what I mean? Um, but grr, if you're just like, what are the cool psychedelic plants? This is a really good book. It's kind of thick, right? I, th I mean, and this is one of the things that I've learned, I'd say in the past year or so. Uh, oh, you guys had Bob here. Um, Bob, uh, Bob Otis, Bob, you know him? You know Bob? Yeah, we'll have him next week. No, Perfect. two weeks, I don't know, something. Um, next Bob, week. Next week? Bob is awesome. Um, you should listen to everything Bob says. Um, but one thing that Bob will tell you, is that um, the question is not almost like what plants have those psychoactive materials. It's more of what plants don't, right? And what are the psychoactive materials that are around? What are the ones that you're looking for? What are the, what's the relationship that you have with them, right? Um, I used to believe that like the US had the most psychoactive, uh, the North, sorry, North America had the most psychoactive plants um, in the world, like as a collection. Nope, they're freaking everywhere. And if you look at the history of the world, there isn't a single culture that hasn't found a way to get fucked up. So 
that tells that tells us a bunch of things. One, um, it's a biological imperative, right? Like, and if you ever like worked with like a two year old and just watched them spin around until they fall on the floor, um, you'll see. Yeah, okay, people like to alter their consciousness. But also, we grew up with plants. We grew up with materials, like as a species. And so there's ways in which we interact that I think um, it's really important to, to dive into and find out a little more about. Landon, did you, were you trying to ask a question before? Yeah, um, I was the other person that was assigned to ask questions. Um, I was wondering, um, based on kind of the, the articles about the dismal swamp and everything, I was kind of thinking while reading it, like, um, like how much uh, the like Maroon's plant knowledge were, was maybe like informed by or like weaved into their uh, like interactions with Native Americans. So uh, do you do you know anything about that? Totally. I just given the time, I didn't want to get into all of it. Um, but like I said, especially in uh, the dismal. There were native communities and uh, actually runaway, um, there was, it was a home for, not a home, well, yeah, kind of, a home for uh, specifically white women who were abused by their husbands would run away to the dismal um, and would live with um, black and uh, Native American folks. Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, her second book was about um, the communities that were in um, the dismal. Um, they before, of course, before African Americans got there, um, Native Americans uh, lived there for um, at least two centuries. Um, the inner, the the intermingling was about fifty to sixty years, but I think when you look at the history of African Americans in the U.S., um, most initial runaway communities went to Native American places, like went to places where Native Americans were. Um, and the plant knowledge among Native Americans, of course, extensive and, and huge. So um, we've definitely built off of that knowledge. Um, it's, yeah, I think it's part of us. I think this is why when I talk about it, I talk about it as an African American and not as an African. Like I make that distinction very clearly because a lot of this plant knowledge we've gotten from Native Americans. Um, I see a, a question about um, the sort of psychedelic renaissance and um, social justice and police brutality and how black and uh, brown people have to be on guard while taking psychedelics. Um, they wanted me, somebody wanted, Victor wanted me to go a little bit more into it. Um, what I can say is I do journey work with folks um, and working with black and brown people um, there's a few things that I have to negotiate, manage. One of which is um, substance, like um, the amount of the substance, because um, usually it takes a. For me, my experience could be different for other people. It takes a lot more to have the same impact than I would be for the average white person, and it's true for myself as well. And I started thinking about why that is. Um, and in my own journeys, one of the things I, I have to fight against is this notion of keeping it together. Um, I have I ran away from home when I was 13. Um, I did a lot of cocaine. Um, it's pretty chronic substance user uh, for most of my life. And, you know, later on got smarter about how I was doing it. But the message that was in my head constantly was keep your shit together, keep your shit together keep your shit together. Doesn't matter how much you're doing, doesn't matter where you are, keep your shit together. You do not, and, and this is no offense to anyone in here, these are the messages that I was told. You do not get to fall apart like these white kids. Okay, I went to boarding school in New Hampshire, just so we're clear. Like, you know, this was like a message told to me before I left, like, yeah, go up there, you can have a good time, you can get high, I don't care, but you can't fall, you can't fall apart like these white kids. And I feel like that's a message that a lot of people of color get, right? that like you have to keep your shit tight at all times, right? And that if you don't, what happens? You get shot, right? You get arrested, you get whatever, right? So how do you get people to tamp down some of that um, resistance in order to be able to have the full experience? 
Now, again, this full experience is based off of a white ordinary. Does that make sense? Like everything we're talking about, about like what, what psychedelic experience should be is based on white people. Right? It's not based on black people. So already, even in that angling, we're kind of, it's kind of colonial, right? Um, how on the other side of that, though, I think the ability to let some of that tightness go might be the very thing that allows brown people and black people to imagine a different sort of future than what history has sort of put forth thus far, right? Like we get, like, if we can imagine ourselves with a little bit more freedom, what that feels like, what that smells like, what that, I don't know, just what that feels like, I think folks might, ha might have some different imaginations about how the future goes. But I'm a sci-fi writer, so that's how I think. I'm like, you know, let's imagine what a different world could be. But I think you have to have that internal experience of peace, of calm. Um, a lot of times what I've found, actually, you know, someone else is telling me, someone who works with, um, with uh, 5-MeO-DMT in the form of toad, uh, toad resin, um, you know, I, I, I'm petrified of 5-MeO-DMT. I'm like, ah, I, I, every time I've seen it, I've some, you know, somebody being like, ah, you know, like losing their shit. I was talking to um, this woman who works with it. She's like, she's like, the black people that I work with don't have that experience. And I was like, really? She's like, yeah, to a T. She's like, I'm like, what is it? She's like, they, they say they feel really relaxed and calm around it. And I'm like, oh my God, is it really that severe? Right, like is, 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 this, is the divide that stark? And I don't know if it is, but the fact that nobody knows whether or not it is, that says a lot. Right, that says a lot about where this renaissance is. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm, I'm reading comments. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't want to go into the history of drug policy in, in the US, um, but like a five minute search will show you it is very much a racist policy. The first drug laws in the US were in San Francisco, permitting, uh, permitting white women from entering Chinatown because they were afraid that white women would go into opium dens and then be sold off by Chinese men. Like how racist is that? <laughs> You know what I mean? So like, if you look like every single law in the US around substances is connected directly to racism. Um, you need more psychedelic experience. Is that directly related to a skin tone? No, I don't think it's directly connected, connected to skin tone. Um, I would say it's connected to uh, psychic, uh, psychological defenses, right? That like, um, you know, my mom used to tell me every time before I left my house, like, you know, watch your back, which I thought was just like a totally normal thing to say to someone. And then only as I got older, I was like, oh my God, that like sets up this sort of thing in your head of like being on the defense all the time, but it was totally normal, right? So I think the more that someone is grounded in that, feeling like they have to watch their backs um, as they walk out in the world, well, anything that, that tells you that like forces you to not watch your back, to, to not be as alert, to not focus in this world so much, by definition is threatening, right? So how do you manage that, that loop? More questions? Yeah. Sarah, I see you have your hand raised. Yeah, I was gonna ask another question. Um, are there like, and I don't, maybe this isn't the right time to ask it, but are there a, like a bunch of psychedelic historians who are like looking into the ways that, you know, psychedelic renaissance is leaving people behind or is it just kind of like you're pushing this right now and getting a lot of feedback or like no support? No, I mean, I think I, lo I love the Bay Area because, um, you know, we're always thinking about stuff like this and we're always talking about stuff like this. I know the Shakuna Institute um, has a whole forum on um, hyping more uh, people of color voices in the um, psychedelic revolution. Um, you know, Sacred Garden, we're super big on it, um, working with a bunch of communities to try and uh, be more inclusive and open and supportive. Um, there's a, there's, um, 
there are way everybody I think everybody is realizing it's an issue I don't think not everybody realizes what to do about it you know and I, I mean and I should be clear I don't know if I know necessarily what to do about it but I'm I'm really pushing having that conversation um I think training more people I think I think we're finally at a place like I started doing this work in 2002 2003 and um you know, I would, I would talk to people and I'd be like, Hey, you know, it sounds like what you really need is a journey. And they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, it'd be about taking, you know, three to five grams of dried mushrooms. And I would sit with you and, you know, see how that works out for you. And we get to talk about, they're like, you're a hippie. And I'm like, no, I'm not. They're like, you're a black hippie. I saw you on TV. And I'm like, no, I'm not a hippie. Like I'm saying this, my they're like, no, I'm not. It's like, it's so hard. It was so hard to get people to understand this as a, as a way of, um, as a, as a way of healing. Um, and I think now we're getting to the place where people are, I mean, I think partially it's the pandemic too. People are starting to be like, okay, look, I need something. I don't know if therapy is necessarily gonna work right now. And it takes a really long time to see any movement. One thing that's really interesting with psychedelics is like, if you're in a, if you're in a right context, there can be a lot of psychological movement relatively quickly. I mean, the point of it isn't the speed, but it is a byproduct. So I, so I think it is happening. Um, I, am tr I am literally in the process of training more people of color, um, not practitioners, but facilitators to work with other people of color to like, to do this work. Um, and I know a big, um, a big sort of angle that um, a lot of people are, are looking at is um, how to do real work in mixed race groups, right? In mixed class groups, mixed gendered groups, right? Like how do you create a safe journey space for women and men and non-binary people together um, so that everyone can journey without feeling like they might be threatened or sexually harassed or, or anything, right? Like how, do we, like how do we build those? And that's one of the things um, for me that's awesome about working specifically with um, specifically on black issues. In doing that, I'm not restricting myself to um, to black people, but by by working with a marginalized group, you actually make it better for everybody. You actually learn skills that help everyone. And I think we need more of that. Um, you said, how far do you think? This need for higher doses of substances to fully let go extends beyond race. Yeah, no, I'm totally with you, Anthony. Um, how f in the chat it says, how far do you think uh, this need for higher doses goes to extend to people beyond race, to anyone who's a foster kid, neglected, abused, or institutionalized, for example? Anyone who had who who is in a defended place on a regular basis um, in this country, <laughs> right? I think sometimes it can be hard to let things go. Now, we can talk about using different things right before the journey to make it easier. Yoga, breathing meditations, other substances, right? Um, I'm talking about teas or, you know, like a whole bunch of other stuff, right? And at least the way that I do the work and the way that I train people to do the work is that you don't just meet somebody and you're like, hey, Bobby, you wanna sit down and have some drugs with me? Cool, let's go. Uh, it's not what it is, right? It's like we're sitting with someone and you're building a relationship and you're saying, well, what is it that you're trying to get out of this? And what can we do to set this up to make it work the best for you? And sometimes for somebody it's like, hey, like I need to be around my family in order to do this. All right, cool. Hey, I need you know, to take a bath before I do this. Okay, cool. Right, like I need to know that like I'll be protected. Okay, cool, right? Like getting those things established first and then going into the journey work. Um, do I think the black community is particularly turned off by classic psychedelics like mushrooms and LSD compared to other drugs? No, I don't, I don't, think, I, don't, I don't think we're turned off by the substances. I think we're turned off by the culture, right? Like I hate dead shows. I'm sorry, I'll say it. I hate the Grateful Dead. I think they're lame. I think fish is even worse. Yeah, I said it. Um, that's not like it's that's not me, right? That's okay. I like Ravi Shankar, 
right? Like, <laughs> um, right? Like, there's a lot of other stuff that I like. Okay, I'll put it to you like this. Um, what was it? 2006, a shipment of um, Israeli, um, Israeli made MDMA hit the shores of the Bay Area. And that is literally how the hyphy movement got started, right? I was here, okay? Like I could literally saw the difference from, from when everybody was smoking weed to everybody started popping Molly, right? And all of a sudden everybody's talking about thism, right? And I was like, okay, that, I mean, been doing this for a while, but okay, right? That's what black people do with MDMA, right? So in the cultural context, what do black people do with, with mushrooms? Thank you, Mac Dre, right? What do, black people, what do black people do with mushrooms? What do black people do with LSD? I don't know, because every time we want to try mushrooms and LSD, no offense, we got to go to some white dude, right? And so we have to go through a white filter in order to get those substances. And if you think that doesn't matter, it's so wrong. <laughs> so, so wrong. That matters. Where and how you get your drugs matters. Who you get your drugs from matters. That is that is the beginning of this of the substance. So, as we start moving, as people of color start moving into this this world on a on a more sure footing, well, what does it mean if you the person who grows your shrooms is black, the person who gets you your shrooms is black, the person that you journey with is black, and you're a black person? Why does every, why does why do all my mushroom journeys have to be multicultural experiences? I'm not against multicultural experiences. I think they're great. They're awesome. I do them all the time, right? But why is that a why is that a mandate? And can we separate that from the actual substance? Once we do that, I think we'll start doing some really interesting work, and we'll really start seeing what a psychedelic renaissance might look like. But right now, it still looks pretty corny. Cool <laughs> um. I'm not currently on this problem, but thank you very much, Sarah. Um, more, more questions, please. This is like far more fun than me yammering. I have a question. Um, I've heard that like Project MK Ultra was um, disproportionately like all black people kind of were the ones who were the test subjects. And mm -hmm. I was wondering, that's what I've heard. I don't know if that's true, but I've heard that it was like a really big hit on the black community. By your whom, I don't know if my question is relevant anymore, but I was gonna ask if you like knew anything about that and how it connects to the culture around psychedelics in the black community. Yeah, no, it's totally relevant. Um, as far as I understand it, MK Ultra was um, was a military experiment, and um, so that so the the people that they were experimenting on primarily were soldiers. Um, and the soldiers that I know of, the, like the guy who committed suicide and, um, you know, a few who, who sued the U.S. government, they were all white. What I will say is that MKUltra and COINTELPRO were pretty much hand in hand. Um, and COINTELPRO was like the, the um, like, ex it was like an express U.S. government supported plan to disrupt all, um, race-based um, coalitions like the Black Panther Party. Um, yeah, and, and all them. Um, with Quint, I mean, I think it's a, it's a question of substances. So I think MK Ultra was using um, hallucinogens and Quintelpro was just using heroin, right? Heroin and actually PCP, um, which is really fascinating. Um, so I think, you know, you could, you could see it as a, as a drug war. Right, but and you know, like using drugs to do the war. But yeah, that's that's what I know about MK Ultra. There, you have a raised hand. I have a quick question, but it's kind of a diversion from what we've been talking about. Go for um, it. I just wonder. Okay, I was wondering what connected you to studying homeless youth in Morocco, London, and New York, and then if New York, or New York the city, or New York the state, and then if the city, what cities in Morocco? Um, so I lived in Morocco. Um, I lived in Morocco when I got kicked out of college. When I got kicked out of undergrad, I moved to Morocco for uh, nine months and then would go back like every three months for like a few years. Um, 
in Morocco, I was mostly in Essaouira, um, but I did, I did work in Tangiers as well. Um, why I did it? I, I mean, so like I said, I ran away from home when I was 13. Um, so for me, it's kind of like once a homeless youth, always a homeless youth. Um, and so what I was really looking at was how do, how did the community that like I kind of came up in, um, how do we look at substance use and how do we look at religion? Um, and basically it was like, you find religion in three, like three times in your life, uh, hatch, match and dispatch. Like when people are born, when people get married or get together, when people die. And at all those events, there was substance use, right? And I'm saying use, I'm not saying abuse. I'm just saying like they were used to, um, to honor the events in some way. Um, so I wanted to see how that worked in a Muslim country. I wanted to see how that worked um, uh, in London just because I, um, I had people there. Um, and then I wanted to see how, how that held up um, in, the US, in New York and then um, over here as well. Yeah. Did you find anything interesting? I'm just wondering like, what were your results of it? Yeah, I mean, kind of kind of that thing that like, um, we, used, we used substances as a way of marking um, a particular, like those particular periods as like en masse. So um, I wrote about, um, you know, in Morocco, like if like two homeless kids um, get married, like there is a bunch, and th this is in the um, Essaouira and then in the, the Reef Mountains too, there is a bunch of hash that gets delivered and it's more hash than anybody can smoke. Um, so everybody smokes and then they, they have like this, it's like a dowry almost um, so that they can trade it, they can, you know, do whatever they want with it, but it's like, it's like wealth. You know what I mean, um, when um, in New York, uh, you know, when, you know, homeless kid dies, um, everyone comes to wherever their friend, their closest people are living, and they dropped off apes and bottles of whiskey, um, right? And again, it was this massive amount. It was a way, like, I think homed people have, um, have substances to show that they can, they can, like, share. And then I think homeless people give substances to, to give people a sense of grounding. It's, it's a sort of homing. Um, so that was what I saw. Thank you. Right. Is this boring for folks, interesting for folks? This is awesome. This is very awesome and very necessary. Cool. Uh, um, I have a question. Um, I was wondering, going back to that comment you made about like um, how like maybe heroin, the, comparing heroin and DMT, I was wondering um, what are your thoughts on like legalization policies and do you think that like drugs like meth or heroin should be legal? Absolutely. I, I think that um, making substances illegal is the definition of some 1960s thinking, right? It's kind of like abortions, like you can make it illegal, but they're still going to happen, right? Like, how are you going to legislate out substance use? Doesn't, it doesn't make sense, right? So if we know the substances are going to be used, why not make safe places for people to use them? Why not get people support for using them? We're focusing on making the substance illegal makes it seem as though the substance is doing the harm. And substances don't, aren't the harmful thing. Um, there's a really awesome guy, um, uh, Bruce Alexander, um, and he talks about the, um, the psychodislocation theory of addiction. What he says is that if you isolate, um, if you isolate a people from their culture and their community, you can expect substance abuse to happen. Um, you, you ever see those, you ever hear about those rat studies, you know, the rat will give a rat a choice between heroin 
and no, not the rat park study, but if you uh, like give a choice, if you give a rat a choice between heroin and water after a while, it will do, it will do more heroin than it'll do water or whatever. Are you, are you familiar with this? Okay. Rats are social creatures. So a rat in isolation is already stressed. If you put a rat with a bunch of other rats and you give it that same op um, option, the rat, will be, the rat will not OD on heroin. The rat will be like, ah, that was enough. That's cool, right? So again, we're look, it's like, how do, we, how do we set up these studies and how do we set up this thinking to actually take in the, not just the individual, but the community. And I'll say that's a, I'll say it's a white science thing, right? That like, that the, the primary mode of, of interpretation is the individual, right? The, the, the primary mode of assessment is the one. And I don't think that that works. I don't think that's human. I think just like rats, we're social creatures. Um, so yeah, I, I think, yeah, I just think legislating substances is just, it's just silly. I mean, not just silly, it's also dangerous, um, but it's, it's very silly. What are your thoughts on treatment programs, specifically absence-based focus like NA or AA? Whatever gets you through the night, yay, in my opinion. I think um, I've known people, I've worked in 12, I've worked in 12 step, recovery models, I've worked in harm reduction models. Harm reduction doesn't work for some people, okay? 12 step doesn't work for some people. It doesn't have to be one thing works for everyone. Whatever works, let it work. But like, you know, 12 step has a, has a reputation of like, you know, our way or the only way, you know? And harm reduction, I mean, I'll tell you my initial resistance to harm reduction was um, it seemed as though, and there's some ways where it's true, so long as you can keep your job, you can keep fucking over your life, right? And it's like, there's gotta be, there's, I think there's gotta be a more nuanced understanding of, of substance use. When I talk about substance use, I talk about relationship, right? What is your relationship to substances? Do you have a chaotic relationship with substances? And what's the, the specific substance? Not like all substances, like me, I have a, let's see, I have a pretty casual relationship with marijuana. I have, have, a, um, I have an intermittent relationship with alcohol. Um, I have no relationship with cocaine anymore. No, no, we're not, we don't get along together. Um, but when, we, when I do do cocaine, I have a very chaotic relationship with cocaine. I can't do cocaine. If I do cocaine, I will do it until you no longer have a TV. Like I will steal everything you have, right? So I can't do cocaine. That's my relationship, right? So can we talk about people's individual relationships with individual substances? Or do we have to talk about drugs? And are you either all for drugs or all not, right? Like it's just too, it's too big. So I, that, that's how I think about uh, a treatment. Um, and that's not the most popular, but I will say, again, as someone who's worked in both those things and someone who's worked with psychedelics to help people quit certain, certain substances, um, I don't know, I think it works. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I actually, uh, I'll, I'll hold my question. Landon, you have a raised hand. Do you wanna ask your question? Oh, sorry, that was left over from last time. I don't. <laughs> okay, I mean, because what I was thinking sort of dovetails off of what you were just saying, I say that, I mean, I think it's incredibly important to, you know, normalize the sort of like open, legitimate conversation about drugs. But what, what you're saying is a lot more nuanced than like public or drug policy and public discourse and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm wondering like, how, how do you change a narrative like that? I think people have to have like, have the, have the real talk conversations. Uh, first of all, people have to be able to have the real talk conversations. Um, part of the problem with, with drug policy in the US is that it's been so curtailed for so long, I, um, you know, people couldn't say like, I have a full-time job and I smoke crack on weekends, right? And there are people that did that, right? 
There are people who are like, like people couldn't say like, I have three kids, um, you know, over the summers, I send them off to summer camp um, and I shoot up every night. People weren't able to say that. So we don't have an accurate snapshot of what substance use actually looks like in the US. If we don't have an accurate, accurate account of that, we can't really move forward. So for me, I'm really looking for models of community health, community locations where people are able to have those conversations about what their substance use actually looks like and developing policy out of that, right? And not off of, I mean, even like a government survey or whatever, it's like, I'm not gonna, you know, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm doing math every other day, I'm not gonna sit there and tell some government worker how much math I'm doing. Are you out of your damn mind? The consequences for that might be insane. So we have to figure out how we get those accurate, accurate snapshots first. Like for instance, every kitchen in the US, like every restaurant kitchen in the US would grind to a halt without cocaine. And every, every restaurant worker knows that, right? We don't talk about that, right? So what do we do with that information? How do we work with that? I think, that, I think those are the next steps. Hmm. Th thank you. Um, Annabelle, what's up? So my question is like, I always see things where it's just like, well, old people have an excuse to be racist or old people have an excuse because they grew up in a different time. And it's like, how do we start now for like replacing that foundation of all drugs are bad and everything is bad. You, you smoke weed once, you might as well just go and try meth for the rest of your life. It's just like, how do we sort of like tear down that mentality and have a more open conversation without everyone doing meth? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I think we start with alcohol. Um, and we look at the harm that alcohol causes. And we talk about why that's legal, right? And the only, only reason is tradition, right? Um, uh, George Washington won his first election because he gave out brandy while his opponent gave out beer. That's the only reason he won, right? It's, it's built into the, 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 the grain of the US is alcohol. Um, Alex de Cocqueville called us a nation of drunkards, okay? Then you go to the medicine cabinet and you look at all the medicines that are there and you look at how many of them have 10, 15 and 20 year um, outcome surveys of what, of what they do to the body, to the brain, to the liver, to the kidney, right? And we'll find out, we don't know, right? So why do we co-sign on those? Because the doctor said so or because the FDA says so, right? Exactly, right? So then we start having the conversation that our substance use and what we get into is not based off of the, the efficacy of it, right? It's based off of who's in power. And once people get that, then you can start having conversations of what would happen if you grew your own drugs, right? Like, what happens if you, you know, have a tea for your headache instead of your, instead of um, aspirin, right? We start moving, because I, I think substance use, I think this altered state is connected to us being disconnected from our bodies. We don't know what works in us and we've outsourced all of our knowledge about our bodies and our minds to experts. In actuality, maybe we're the experts for our own bodies, our own minds, our own minds. We just have to listen to ourselves. So it's a lot of getting in relation, getting in right relationship with the self, which just so we're clear, is exactly what I do when I'm working with people with, with um, sacred plants and medicines. I'm like, I'm guiding in the sense that I'm creating a safe space, but the entire goal is for the person to get connected with themselves. So I think it's just a bigger sort of community integration model of like, how do we get everyone to start thinking about their own health, their own mental well-being, and finding ways that they can take charge of it instead of outsourcing that authority to other people. And that is hard, but there is time. Thank you. No worries. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so dare. <laughs> um, yeah, D.A.R.E. was hilarious, man. I'm sorry, as someone who was doing a lot of cocaine during D.A.R.E., 
I was just like, wow, you guys are funny. Um, Broke that contract that you signed when you were nine. Never signed it in my life. I was like, you want me to sign a what for who and go where to do what? I don't know you. Like, like I don't know your last name. Well, you want me to sign a contract? I'm nine. Like, what? Uh, so that part was weird. Then um, it never mentioned alcohol. And that was the thing where I was like, there are drunk people on the street right now that could sign this contract and be okay. Right? And I was like, I, that just... And then Nancy Reagan was down with it. And like Nancy Reagan always scared me because like when I was a, like literally, I think in fifth grade, in fourth grade, sorry, I'm going random now. In fourth grade, we had um, band practice at my school and I played the violin. And then in fifth grade, they pulled all the instruments out. And I was like, what happened? And my teacher just said, Reagan. And I was like, what? He was, he was, she was like, yeah, Reagan, they cut it. So we, you don't have band at school anymore. And I was like, are you for real? And she's like, yeah. And so every time I signed Nancy Reagan, I was like, I hate you because I like the violin. Um, so Nancy Reagan was down with Dare and I was like, nah, I'm messing with you. And then it was, again, Black Kid in Harlem. Every Dare person was a white person. And every dare person coming into school was saying, hey kids, it's not cool to do drugs. And then you're like, but you're not cool. <laughs> like, of course, like, yeah, you want me to be like you? No, I don't want you. Or if they did have a black person come in, they would come in with some, the worst rap ever. If you ever want to have so much fun, just go on YouTube and look up dare 80s raps. They're so funny. And you're just like, wow, this is, this is lame. I know, I think Harley just went to look right now. Um, so like all of that was just like, no, like I can't, like I just, I can't get behind that. Um, yeah. If, and then if you look, sorry, and then from a, like a real perspective, from like a sociological perspective, if you look at, um, are you familiar with like the promise keepers, like promise rings? There's this whole thing about like, if you wanted to be true to God, um, you, you got a promise ring and uh, this is for uh, girls, put a promise ring on and you promise that you're not going to have sex till marriage. They did an outcome study five years later, 70% of those girls had an STI, 40% of them were pregnant, third, and like none of them knew anything about um, how to protect themselves. Like abstinence is not, a f it's, it's not a strategy. <laughs> Like, it, like just from a public health standpoint, it is not an effective strategy. So D.A.R.E. was solely to get Republican voters online. It had nothing to do with substance use, had nothing to do with care of communities, you know? <laughs> so yeah, D.A.R.E. was, D.A.R.E. was really freaking lame. We haven't had a good drug, we haven't had a fair and equitable drug policy in the U.S. ever. So um, Annabelle, like in terms of places to start, start with that. You know, we've got, you know, we've got decrim nature, right? Like that, there's, there's that part of Oakland that's super cool. Um, but like on a, on a federal level, we don't have it. Now's the time. Now we can actually start having real conversations about substance use. And unfortunately, I mean, not unfortunately, but it's going to be, it's going to need to be, it can't be, um, I don't, I don't really think it can be um, people of color that lead that movement. Like, I, I, like one, I think so many people of color have internalized substance use as a, as a um, demotivator for upward social mobility. Two, I think uh, uh, politicians of color don't wanna take that risk, right? So I think, I think it's, it, it just can't be people of color. It's gotta be, it's gotta be, it's gotta be white people. So get to it. Come on. I'm trying. Any, any policy folks out there, like just, just get it. Sure. You want to go ahead? Yeah. I'd actually like to disagree with that point because I think the underlying issue is people needing credentials and that's why our country moves uh, in this, uh, I was talking to Kosh about this in a very slow way because to acquire credentials takes a large investment. 
And maybe that's why it seems like white people need to lead this charge because I mean, medicine and a lot of like, like higher, uh, like higher education is like predominantly white. However, I think if a black person became a, a psychiatrist and got all the right credentials, they would be, I don't know, accepted into this world. Um, I mean, no offense. Yeah. I've got a master's in divinity. I've got a master's in clinical psychology. I've got a master, master's in creative writing. There is still 10 times more of a risk for me to come out public. I mean, I've been doing this work since 2002. Just now I'm coming out publicly talking about doing this work, right? Like I have far more to lose than a white colleague with the same credentials who talks about doing this work. Like that, like it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter with credentials, unfortunately. I like, I hear the argument, but like, it's, you can have all the credentials in the world and you're still gonna be a black dude in America. And like, if they're like, oh, you're, you're, you're doing drugs. I'm like, no, I'm leading journeys with people who are going through stuff using sacred plants. That sounds like drugs. I'm sorry, I can't hire you. Like that, I'm, I've had that conversation. <laughs> so, you know, I've had it from, I've had it from the, from the credential standpoint. Yeah, I mean, we are talking to Dr. Uh, Carhart Harris and he was saying, if we want to enter this field, like one of the most, uh, like he advises us to go for like, to become like an MD and become a psychiatrist. Like in the sense, like that's how you like get the right credentials. And I'm not saying that your credentials, I, I don't see that your credentials necessarily map onto like the doctor in terms of like the superficiality, you know? Um, not that you didn't put the same amount of work and it's just as valuable. Yeah. No, I totally hear you. I mean, I, so I think initially what I was talking about was policy. And I think in terms of policy an MD doesn't really work that doesn't do much for you. Right. I think if you're working policy, um, you know, that's a, actually, that's the really good thing about policy. You, if you write good policy and you work for the right people, the credentials don't really matter. Yeah, sure. You can get a, like a JD, which would be awesome. Um, you know, some, some knowledge of public health would be good, but that's more about, can you get things passed? Can you work with legislation? Can you work with politicians? Can you work with community? MDs, you know, MDs are in a, are in a funny spot because like now they're talking about this work, but from the night, from, from the 1950s until now, they shut up. They didn't say word one about this for the longest time. As soon as FDA was like, nope, you can't talk about drugs. They were like, okay, cool. So in terms of forwarding policy, I don't, I, you know, I'll put it this way. I have MDs coming to me now learning about this work. And I'm, and, and they've, they've, they've had their MDs far longer than I've had any of my degrees. So I'm kind of like, well, you know, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think that's a very fair point. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, yeah, uh, I had a panel with alum lawyers. Or you, yeah, like you know, credentials. If you can get them, and you don't have to like go into super debt for them, <laughs> great. Um, but the work is always there. You know what I mean? Like you can, the work, there's always, there's always work to do. And for me, like I talk to people that get the work done. Um, I don't care for public policy and being a voice for something like decriminalization campaigns is much more racially sensitive than doing research. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, it's so much fun to rag on boomers, <laughs> but I, I've been, I've been trying to let it go. Uh, boomers will fight with whoever holds an opinion that they disagree with. I don't think there's anything wrong with the fight um, so long as there's respect. I think like, you know, I can disagree with the boomer and so long as they don't act like I don't know anything, we'll be all right, you know. Um, Madison, yeah. Madison, do you wanna ask your question? Yeah, it's more of just a comment. Um, I wanted to just say thank you for coming to talk to us because um, actually for our response that we had to do this week, um, it was kind of asking like what is missing from like the speakers that we've had thus far um, 
And I think like, especially as like a non-STEM major, um, I'm a history major. And I think that this was um, an integral part of just the broader topic of psychedelics that we were really missing in this class. And um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you, Madison. Yeah, I'm I'm not a STEM person. Like I, I can get down, like I can read a paper, but like, um, as you could probably tell from the beginning, like history, psychology, like those are sort of my, those are my orientations in, in anthropology. So um, yeah, I think no matter what discipline you come from, there's tons of work to do in this field um, and you can just get at it, you know? Yeah, damn boomers. They thought everything was so much better in the 60s. I was like, well, why did you trash San Francisco? But I'm letting that go. Anyway. More, more questions, comments, concerns, anything. Yeah. This is perfect in every way. Want nothing else? Um, I would love to hear more about the Iboga ceremonies that you witnessed, just what they were like. I haven't really heard much about them at all, so I'd, I'd love to hear more. Well, um, I began, it does two things. Um, it helps um, block um, opioid receptors so that like uh, people who are suffering withdrawals from um, opioids, they don't feel them anymore. It's also a really powerful hallucinogen. Um, it's one of the few ones that, that I haven't seen people have like a good trip on, so to speak. Um, and so there's a lot of throwing up, um, a lot of um, shitting on oneself. I mean, I don't know the way of saying it. Like a lot of shitting on oneself, a lot of peeing on oneself. Um, and I would assist in some, um, uh, some, some healing work. You know, like this is kind of how I started with this, not knowing any different, but it was like, you know, people needed help. Um, regular treatment in terms of 12 step wasn't working for them. Um, and so they needed, um, they, they wanted to do something else. They wanted to step up a little bit. And so um, I was, you know, it was basically a scare tactic because I was doing too much Coke. And one of my family members was like, okay, you're going to end up like these guys if you don't, you know, straighten up. And so he's, they're like, you know, clean this puke and, you know, mop the shit. And I was like, that's gross. And then I was like, okay, I want to do more cocaine now because that was gross. Um, so it didn't really work, but um, it did put me in the context of like substance use as, as like healing work, right? That like there was a recreational like I was doing, the chaotic re recreational that I was doing there was the casual that I'd seen, you know, other people doing like smoking weed or whatever. And then there was this other work that substance use could do, that it could radically shift people's lives and make it in a um, better way. But of course, you know, when you're 12, 13, what the hell do you know about that? Like, I, did, I was like, I just understood it as something that could happen, but it wasn't something that I was directing my life towards. And then as I got older, I was like, oh, that's what's going on. I'm I'm curious about how your how your writing and how your novels tie into all the rest of your work. One of the main characters of my novels is a sentient tuber that has a plan to fight against the entropy of the world by using humans. So yeah, <laughs> lots of uh, lots of substance use there. Um, basically, to to communicate with this tuber, you have to smoke a bit of it. Um, and then sort of like those, um, sort of like the Vodun stuff, like the spirit talks through the person that smokes it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think science fiction or just writing in general is another way of uh, getting into an altered state. If you ever get into a book so much that you look up and three hours have gone by and like, how did that happen? Well, I've had a few, few mushroom journeys like that as well, so. Yeah. But yeah. Um, you know, I think we we think of creativity as um, as recreation, um, and I think artists, if I can use that term, uh, think of creativity as a necessity. 
Um, and I think sacred plant use is a way of tapping into that necessity. Yeah. Yes, uh, Victor, uh, Abogate has been used as a treatment for opioid addiction. And that's, that's kind of the work that I was doing when I was younger. I mean, I wasn't doing it, I was cleaning up afterwards. And yeah, that's, you know, my, um, a lot of my writing started out as trying to make sense of journeys. Yeah. More questions, interactions, come on. Um, do you think you can share with us um, a little bit about that, that painting behind you? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, from my friend Annie Artino, um, homeless youth advocate out of Minnesota. Um, that is actually on the back of a cardboard box, uh, a cardboard uh, box that she used to sleep on back in the day. And she made that. Um, that's all cray paws. Um, and she's made that for me. God, must be almost 20 years ago. Um, and wherever I move, I take that with me because that's what love is. You got another one too, but. More nudie, but you know, appropriately. So. Um, I had a question about the maps microaggression stuff you were talking about. Yeah. Um, is that a a result of just like white people not being aware of what they were saying, or is that something that like is that something that education could address, or is it just something that fundamentally isn't working? Or the fact that it's a cross gender cross-racial cross scenario. I think it totally can be addressed, but I think you have to acknowledge it as an issue. So I was in a, um, I was with a group of folks who were, you know, training to do this work. And I was very clear from the beginning, like, I'm a black person. Uh, I was like, when the first thing I said, I was like, I'm a black guy, in case you couldn't tell. Um, my goal in this is to work with black people in this work. And like, the level of discomfort that was in that room was astounding. And I was like, what did I say? Like, did I say that I kill babies? Like, no, I just said that like, I'm a black guy and I'm interested in doing this work with black people. And they didn't have a, they didn't have a way of, of holding that. And so I think when you're building studies and you're, and you're talking about stuff and, you, and one of your criteria, one of the things that you're not looking at is race. That's not a box that you need to check. That's not, a, that's not something you have to review as you, before you go to the next step. Well, then your own unconscious bias is allowed to just flow through, right? And so if, right, like if in your criteria of, of a, of a um, patient or a client or whatever, you know, you have age, uh, gender, occupation, height, weight, you know, but like nothing about race, right? Well, then you can, you can measure how all those things ha like look like after the journey, but, you, but if you don't have a category to think about how did that race impact, then you know, you're leaving the person to just deal with it on their own. Well, usually that's fine, but like if someone's in an altered state, you know, I used to be very resistant. Um, I mean, you know, to this day, if my friends are like, hey, do you want to come to this party? I mean, back when we used to go to parties, when, you know, somebody's like, hey, do you want to go to this party? I'm like, am I going to be the only black guy there? If they're like, yeah, I'm like, then no, I don't want to go there. Like, why the hell do I want to do that? But then if you're the only black person at the freaking journey, like with freaking MDMA or with mushrooms, or with LSD, like imagine how uncomfortable that is. And if no one's gonna talk about it, well then how do you expect to have a successful, how do you expect to, how do you expect to have results that'll be relevant to people of color? If you don't expect to have those results, well then fine, cool, go forward, be happy. But if you want to include people of color, you've got to think about people of color, you've got to talk about people of color. You know, um, in terms of bad trips, I, mean, I think that was like, a, I shouldn't have said bad trips. All trips are useful. Um, uh, Ibogaine is, um, it is, a, um, it is a, it's part of the, the Bwiti, Bwiti tradition in Africa. Um, and it is, it is used as a sacrament. It, it is used as a, a sacred plant. Um, in the US, again, this is back to this notion of getting high. 
we assume that plants that that the journey that a plant takes us on is supposed to be pleasant right in actuality um culturally a lot of times plants especially around rites of passage are used to simulate death right or to simulate um some some pain and the idea is that if you can face that pain then you are ready for adulthood marriage parenting you know being an elder whatever right and so ibogaine is one of those it's like a it's a threshold it's a it's a rite of passage sort of um that that, that you have to go through um so yes uh it brings up stuff in the self that is that one has to work on but it but it does hurt <laughs> how do we integrate rites of passage in our culture in the state man i've been asking that question for so dang long um I don't know. I, I always tell the story of um, I was traveling in Ethiopia um, and drove past this like nine year old girl and she had a camel, a donkey, five goats and three dogs and homegirl was handling it like she was not tripping at all. She was like, yep, pap smacking the donkey like, you know, pulling the thing right like getting just super, super tight. And I was like, no one is gonna argue with that girl about her neuroplasticity or whether or not she's ready for adulthood or whether or not she's able to go to college. Like she's good. She's been given freaking responsibility. She took her responsibility and she's killing it. But in the US, we hobble teenagers by giving them too much help. <laughs> Like I honestly and truly believe, like sometimes you just have to, like things have to be uncomfortable. Like right, a rite of passage means things don't work out well. I am screwed up because I ran away from home when I was 13. I don't understand teenagers these days. They're like, I'm so pissed at my mom. I'm like, move out. Like, why are you arguing with a grown woman? Move out. Like, I, I don't, I can't have a job. Then shut up, she's paying rent. Like move forward, you know what I mean? I don't know, I'm not like the, the right person for this one, but, um, there's a there's a, a coddling in the US that I think in the long term will hurt folks. Um, yeah, I'm seeing the Zapotec tribe in Oaxaca uses psilocybin as a rite of passage for children as young as five. It's not even a rite of passage for kids as young as five. They just give them something to go to sleep so they can have nice dreams. Like, that's the thing. Like, we think of these things as like, oh, these are substances. And it's like, for some people, it's like, no, this is food. This is like medicine. This is, this is a nighttime dream. This is how to deal with nightmares. This is like a love potion, right? This is part of their embedded community. The way that we are approaching substances are ready. Like everybody's talking about microdosing. Microdosing is so freaking white Western. It's like, well, you can only take this much on a regular basis and it's only just a little bit at a time. And that way you measure it. And that way it doesn't feel too much, but it feels enough. And then you can have great cycle. Dude, just take a little bit and move on and shut up. Right. But like, you know, I at Waldman writes a book about it. And all of a sudden, like, it's, you know, it's the new best, most important thing to do. Michael Pollan, like, you know, so, right. So Sarah's like, when a little psilocybin keep you up, Maybe it would for you, but if you grow up taking it on a regular basis, whenever you have a nightmare, maybe not, right? Maybe if it's mixed in with your food so that it's not like I am taking a mushroom now, but this is just something that I do every Wednesday and, and Saturday, it's gonna have a different effect on you, right? So, it's ha so our approaches to the substances are just as important as the substances themselves. That's what I think.